Welcome back to the Easy Med channel where medical topics are made easy. Today we're going to be talking about beta adrenergic receptors. And as always on Easy Med, you're going to be given some easy tricks and strategies to remember the content. So what are adrenergic receptors? In order to better understand this, we're going to briefly talk about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. There's a previous Easy Med video that talks about the autonomic nervous system in detail, which I'll link above. Feel free to check that out if you want more information. But in that video, we talked about how the sympathetic nervous system is involved in generating the fight or flight response, whereas the parasympathetic nervous system is involved in increasing activity related to rest and digest. Both of these systems are continuously working and they essentially counteract one another. The sympathetic nervous system will increase its activity secondary to situations that provoke fear, danger, anxiety, stress. And some of these responses include dilating the pupils, decreased salivation, dilation of the airways and bronchi, increased heart rate, and decreased digestion and urination. The parasympathetic nervous system is essentially the opposite and helps to regulate the sympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic activity will increase in situations in which we are at rest, and some of these responses include constricting the pupils, increasing salivation, constricting the bronchi, decreasing or normalizing heart rate, and increasing digestion and urination. So as you can tell, the autonomic nervous system is responsible for these involuntary responses and movements, and that's exactly what the autonomic nervous system does. Remember that we said that the autonomic nervous system is a branch of the peripheral nervous system, and it's involved in those involuntary responses, including movements of smooth muscle and cardiac muscle. This is in contrast to the somatic nervous system, which is a different branch of the peripheral nervous system, and it's involved in generating voluntary muscle movements using skeletal muscle. So where do adrenergic receptors come into play? Adrenergic receptors are involved in the autonomic nervous system, specifically the sympathetic side of things. Adrenergic receptors are located on cells and tissues throughout the body, and they're the targets for catecholamines such as norepinephrine and epinephrine that are produced or increased by sympathetic activity. And when these catecholamines bind to adrenergic receptors, it's going to induce that fight or flight response. Here's a closer look at the sympathetic nervous system and how it interacts with the adrenergic receptors. The sympathetic nervous system arises from the central nervous system in the thoracal lumbar region, specifically T1 through about L2. And what these preganglionic sympathetic neurons do is they terminate really close to the spinal cord at the sympathetic chain. The sympathetic chain is a collection of neuronal cell bodies called ganglia. Preganglionic sympathetic neurons release acetylcholine onto nicotinic cholinergic receptors on the cell bodies of postganglionic sympathetic fibers. What this will do is it will generate an action potential through the postganglionic neuron and they will release a catecholamine called norepinephrine. Postganglionic neurons terminate on target tissues and organs and this is where adrenergic receptors come into play. These target tissues and organs contain adrenergic receptors in which the norepinephrine can bind to. When this binding occurs, it will produce that fight or flight response that we talked about before. The last thing to mention is that there are preganglionic sympathetic neurons that also terminate on the adrenal medulla. This will increase norepinephrine and epinephrine release from the adrenal medulla into the bloodstream. So now we have norepinephrine that's released by the postganglionic sympathetic neurons plus norepinephrine and epinephrine that are released by the adrenal medulla and they're circulating in the bloodstream. And all of these catecholamines combine to adrenergic receptors to induce that fight or flight response. So now that we have a good understanding of how adrenergic receptors are involved in the sympathetic nervous system to generate a fight or flight response, let's talk about the different types of adrenergic receptors and where they're located in the body. There are two main types of adrenergic receptors, alpha and beta. We're going to focus on the beta receptors in this video, and there will be a separate video on the alpha receptors, so keep an eye out for that. There are three main types of beta receptors, beta 1, 2, and 3. All of the beta receptors are coupled with GS proteins, which ultimately increase cyclic AMP levels. The only thing you need to remember with beta-1 receptors is that they're primarily located in the heart and in the kidneys. Let's start off with the heart. There are beta-1 adrenergic receptors located within the conduction system of the heart. When catecholamines such as norepinephrine and epinephrine bind to these beta-1 adrenergic receptors, it's going to increase the SA node automaticity and conduction velocity through the AV node. This will ultimately increase heart rate. There are also beta-1 adrenergic receptors located on contractile heart muscles. And when catecholamines bind to these receptors, it's going to increase cardiac contraction, which will ultimately increase stroke volume. In a previous EasyMed video, which I'll link above, we talked about the body's mechanisms to improve blood pressure when hypotension or shock is present. And we said that cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. So if we increase heart rate and we increase stroke volume, 
we're going to increase cardiac output. We also said in that video that blood pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. So if we increase cardiac output, we're going to increase blood pressure. And this makes complete sense. Think about the sympathetic nervous system. When we're in a situation of danger, fear, anxiety, stress, or exercise, we're going to want to increase that blood pressure and cardiac output. And this is one of the ways that we do it. We activate the beta-1 adrenergic receptors in the heart to increase cardiac output, which in turn increases blood pressure. Well, there's another way that we increase blood pressure using beta-1 adrenergic receptors, and that involves the kidneys. There are specific cells in the kidneys called the juxtaglomerular cells. If you remember from the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system video, which I'll link above, the juxtaglomerular cells are involved in releasing renin. And one of the ways they do this is that they contain beta-1 adrenergic receptors on them, so increased sympathetic activity will lead to increased renin release from the juxtaglomerular cells. Renin is the first step in the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and when this system is activated, it will ultimately increase or improve blood pressure. We're not going to go into too much detail on how it does that. You can check out the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system video for more information. The takeaway point with beta-1 adrenergic receptors is that they're mainly located in the heart as well as the kidneys, and when they're activated, they work synergistically to increase blood pressure during that fight-or-flight response. The next beta receptor type is beta-2 receptors. Again, they're coupled with GS proteins, which ultimately increase cyclic AMP levels. So we said the main thing to remember with beta-1 receptors is that they're primarily located in the heart and lungs. Well, the main thing to remember with beta-2 receptors is that they're primarily located on smooth muscles. And whenever a beta-2 receptor on a smooth muscle gets activated, it's going to lead to smooth muscle relaxation. So here are a few examples. There are beta-2 receptors within the lungs. Well, we said whenever a beta-2 receptor gets activated, it's going to lead to smooth muscle relaxation. And so that's going to lead to bronchodilation. And that's important during a fight-or-flight sympathetic response. When we're in a situation of danger, we're going to want to open those airways to allow for better breathing and ventilation. Another example is in the GI tract. There are beta-2 receptors that line the intestines. In a situation of danger, is digestion important for immediate survival? No, it's not really that important. So activation of these beta-2 receptors will lead to smooth muscle relaxation, and this will decrease peristalsis of the intestines. This will decrease movement of food content in stool and ultimately decrease digestion. Another example is on blood vessels. Again, if we activate beta-2 receptors, it's going to lead to smooth muscle relaxation. In the case of blood vessels, this will lead to vasodilation. There are increased numbers of beta-2 receptors on arteries that supply skeletal muscles, as well as on the coronary arteries. And this makes sense, again, during a fight-or-flight response, we're going to want to increase blood flow to the heart and skeletal muscles, and we do so by vasodilation. Another example is the bladder. Again, during a fight-or-flight response, is urination going to be important for immediate survival? It's really not that important. So there are beta-2 receptors that are located on the wall of the bladder, and when they get activated, it's going to relax those smooth muscles of the bladder, and it's going to lead to decreased urination. The last point I want to make with beta-2 receptors is that they're located in the liver. During a fight-or-flight response, we increase our metabolism, so we're going to need to increase our energy or glucose levels. When beta-2 adrenergic receptors are activated in the liver, it's going to lead to gluconeogenesis as well as the breakdown of glycogen into glucose. There are also beta-2 adrenergic receptors within the pancreas. When they're activated, it's going to increase release of insulin so we can use that glucose. The final beta receptor type is beta-3 receptors. Again, they're coupled with GS proteins, which increase cyclic AMP levels. All you need to remember with beta-3 adrenergic receptors is adipose tissue in the bladder. When beta-3 receptors are activated in adipose tissue, it leads to the breakdown of fat. It was also recently discovered that there could be beta-3 receptors in the detrusor muscle of the bladder. When these are activated, it too will lead to bladder relaxation and decreased urination very similar to when beta-2 adrenergic receptors were activated. Let's wrap this up with the summary of the beta receptors. The key takeaway point with beta-1 receptors is to remember that they're mainly located in the heart and in the kidneys. When beta-1 receptors are activated in the heart, it increases heart rate and stroke volume, which ultimately increases cardiac output and blood pressure. When the beta-1 receptors are activated in the kidneys, it leads to renin release from the juxtaglomerular cells. This will activate the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and this will work to improve and increase blood pressure as well. The key point to remember with beta-2 receptors is that they're mainly located on smooth muscles. When they're activated, it leads to smooth muscle relaxation. 
They're also located in the liver, and this is going to increase glucose levels. The key takeaway point with beta-3 receptors is that they're mainly located in adipose tissue and possibly on the detrusor muscle of the bladder, which will lead to decreased urination. Hopefully this helped you better understand beta receptors. If you found the video useful, please consider subscribing so you don't miss out on future medical topics that are made easy. Thanks for watching. Hope you check out future videos.